أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أسر الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين لله الشهداء بالقص ولا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم على أن لا تعدلوا اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in his blessed name for granting us the power of strength and valor by which to rise against injustice and to be promoters of equity on earth. When Allah says, Ya ladin amanu kunu qawwamina lillahi shuhada bil qist Be the witnesses of the, and the bearers of justice. Kunu qawwamina lillahi shuhada bil qist وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَن لَا تَعَدِلُوا Do not let a hatred of people incite you to become unjust. اِعْدِلُوا Meaning be just. هُوَ أَقْرَبُوا لِلتَّقْوَىٰ It is close. In other words, it is towards piety, God consciousness. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And be God conscious. Allah sees what you do. إِنَّ اللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Indeed, Allah sees what you do, meaning Allah is observing our actions and He has placed us on this earth for a very short period of time. And if there is one thing that is very detestable to us, it's when there is injustice. When you saw these beautiful young children come forward with banners and flags, and you see free Palestine, free Yemen, free Kashmir, and you're looking at the Muslim world in tatters. It's being invaded every single minute, every single hour. Our resources are being taken from us. We're being vilified. And if you fight for your land, you're called a terrorist. If you occupy land, you're considered legitimate today. Hmm? If you fight for your freedom, you're considered a terrorist if you're not on the side of shaitan. You know, when we talk about Karbala and we talk about the Banu Umayyah, and when we examine how Muawiyah and the Banu Umayyah were, that anybody had even a slight inclination towards Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib والسلام, was arrested and killed. Hujr ibn Adi, Maytham al Tammar, right? Qambar, who was a servant of Imam Ali, every one of them, Hajjaj bin Yusuf, took Qambar and killed him. We find Maytham was crucified, right? Maytham at Tammar was crucified. Why? Simply because they were associated with Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa sallam. Salawat. And if there is one thing that is disturbing our psyche in the world today, it is precisely this fact that truth is being covered, it's being obfuscated, and that you and I are being forced to submit to the tyrant's way. You and I can argue for or against the existence of God and no one will arrest you. You can say God doesn't exist, you will not be arrested. You can vilify a president, but there are certain critical issues with regards to the invasion of land that has been stolen. You find if you dare say anything about them, you are branded an anti-Semite and you are branded as a terrorist. You find the minute you fight against injustices, you'll see the terror group XYZ. But then the other group that is the real terrorist, that is 
taking land, destroying the lives of everybody, unjustly the way Yazid and Muawiyah were doing, today they are considered the powers of the world. They are considered the legitimate forces of the world. And they are considered that their, their value is so important that the life of the Muslim is useless. Allah addresses this in the Quran. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ هَادُوا إِنْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ لِلَّهِ مِنْ دُونِ النَّاسِ O oh you, Hadu, you claim to be chosen people of God. Somehow, the rest of the world is the scum of the earth. With all due fairness, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, black, white, brown, yellow, are all beautiful creations and they're all chosen people of God. Not one group is superior. For you and I to believe that there is a God who leans on my side because he's in my pocket and that he has chosen me among all of you and when he created humanity, he created the finest and then what was left over, he created the rest of humanity is the furthest from truth. It's the biggest lie ever perpetrated on earth. Allah says, فَتَمَنَّوا الْمَوْتِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ then invoke return to your Lord. They will not do it because they are liars. You see? They fabricate. And in today's world, we see a country like Yemen, the poorest country in the Middle East, among a beautiful group of people, peace loving, who are being bombarded incessantly every single day. Tens of thousands of children being maimed and made into orphans. Millions of people in Yemen are starving. Starving to the point of no return. Is the world lifting a finger? Is anybody caring about it? No, because if you're not on the side of the master of the world, then you deserve to be punished and killed. This is why we commemorate Karbala. If you see the people who are rising against this tyranny, this form of tyranny that is taking the rights of humanity, not only of the Muslims, but even of the non-Muslims, only because they feel it is their right to have hegemony and to co control human beings as slaves. You know, we have more slaves on earth today than ever in the history of the human race. The difference is before there were chains and shackles which you could see, and today they're invisible. Human trafficking is unprecedented today. Evil forces are controlling the world in such heinous ways that when we resonate with Imam Hussein alayhi salam, going towards Kufa, which he was pushed towards Karbala, this was his message. Hmm? That I am fighting to bring the religion of my grandfather, the Prophet, upright, for it has been ignored. When Allah says, Kunu qawwamina lillah, maintain justice, even if it is against your own liking, you must love justice. Imam Ali salam was exemplary in that matter. That when his shield was taken, a man of the Christian faith took it. And Imam Ali salam was the Khalifa of the time. He could have executed him with no questions asked, and nobody would have batted an eye with regards to that. And he says to the Christian man who was under the dominion of Imam Ali salam, you and I as Muslims, when we rule and there are Christians, Jews, Hindus, atheists under our tutelage, we must respect them and honor them. And their lives are as valuable and as precious as the life of a Muslim. You find Imam Ali salam says to this Christian man, that is my shield. He said, no, it is mine. Imam says, then I must bring you to court. Look at the due process. Imam Ali exemplifies the ultimate justice that this is a man of Christian faith. Hmm? Yet Imam Ali does not look down on him and say he's a Christian, he's a kafir, and I can abuse him. The world is doing that to the Muslims today. You find the Rohingyas today are being exterminated from Burma only because they are Muslims. You find in Bosnia, they were being killed only because they are Muslims. Where we are Muslims, we are being marginalized. And Allah is saying, if you do not rise, Allah says, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma biqawmin 
Allah does not change the affairs of a community until the community changes themselves first. It means that you and I have free will to practice. Limited, but we have it. And if we do not claim our right, and we do not claim our honor, and if we do not claim our justice, then the world will not give it to us. Promise. There are very few God conscious people on earth who have the audacity to stand up against tyranny by which to give to humanity their due justice. Imam Ali salam says, if you unfold the seat of authority upon me, I will not deny an insect the husk of a grain. Meaning I will be so just that even the insect will be given justice. This is Islam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. But what does it take? It takes shuja'at. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fatih, Muhammad al-Rasulullah, وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ أَشِدَّا وَلَا الْكُفَّارِ رُحَمَاءُ بَيْنَهُمْ تَرَاهُمْ رُكَّعًا سُجَّدًا يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانَ سِيمَاهُمْ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ مِنْ أَثَرِ السُّجُودِ ذَلِكَ مَثَلٌ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَمَثَلٌ فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ كَزَرْئِنَ أَخْرَجَ شَطْعُ فَآزَرَهُ فَاسْتَغْلَضَ فَاسْتَوَى عَلَى سُوقِ يُعْجِبُ الزُّرَّعُ لِيَغِيذَ بِهِمُ الْكُفَّارُ Look how elegant the verse of the Quran, the last verse in Surah Al-Fat, the 48th chapter. Muhammad and those who are with him. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارُ They are firm against rejection, the troublemakers, the evildoers, the Muawiyahs, the Yazids, the Saddams, the evil people of the world today. Hmm? Merciful with each other. We are brothers and sisters in the community, brothers and sisters. And I must say that before we go and condemn the enemy, let us point a finger at ourselves that we, as a Muslim community, need to be united. We need to honor each other. We need to respect each other. We need to stop backbiting each other. We need to stop marginalizing each other, even in business. It is our duty. Allah says, وَعَتَصِّمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Maintain and hold on to the rope of Allah together and do not differentiate. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَى Indeed, the believers are brethren. فَأَصْلِهُ بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ The believers are brethren. Therefore, make peace between your, yourselves so that the mercy of Allah increases upon you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ We lack rahmah because we're divided. Between our own communities, center to center, community to community, which marja do you follow? Oh, I don't like your marja. You know what? I don't like you. Your marja is a kafir. You are a kafir. When did Islam tell us to do this? Who authorized us to do this? When did Allah enable us to do these kinds of finger pointing and condemnations? Oh, he's a follower of that. How dare we say that? When shahadatain, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَيْكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ The believers are those who believe in Allah and the Prophet. Then they don't doubt. ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ They struggle with their selves, وَأَنفُسِهِمْ With their wealth and their selves, فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ These are the truthful ones. When we look each at each other as a community, it saddens me how much bickering, backbiting, fault-finding is between us. We have forgotten this. It is easy for me to say the Zionists are the troublemakers. We can say XYZ army are the troublemakers. ISIS are the troublemakers. Yes, they are. But they are nothing. They are like the house of a spider. Hmm? Allah says it. Like the house of a spider. Weak. Inna the weakest of the houses is the house of a spider. This is how they are. But you know when they become strong? When you and I become weak. When you and I bicker, Sunni, Shia, Sunni, Shia, he's kafir, this one's kafir. When did Allah allow this behavior? Tell me. People say, oh, we are Shia, therefore Sunni is wrong. We are Sunni, Shia, Zarafidi. Who allowed us this? 
In the deen and Allah is Islam. The religion to Allah is Al Islam. The religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya you ladina amanu, atiullah wa atiul rasul wa ulinamri minkum. Fa in tanazatum fi shayin faruddu ilallah wa rasul. In kuntum tukminu nabillah wa liyum al akhir. Allah has given us strict instructions. Oh, you believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those vested with authority from among you, the Ahlul Bayt, the Imams, hands down, there's nobody else. Ulil Amri Minkum is no one else. If you read the Arabic correctly, Ita'at is mentioned twice. The third group has no Ita'at in it. Atiullah, wa Atiul Rasul, wa Ulil Amri Minkum. The third group's Ita'at comes from Allah and the Prophet. And Allah takes it further. He says, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ And if you have a doubt about this, then return to Allah and the Prophet if you truly believe in God on the Day of Judgment. Simple. It's not complicated. And who authorizes to damn and condemn? If I were the devil, God forbid, or I was a troublemaker, that's all I need to do is find weakness between the two of you, and I come and become schismatic, and I become a person who's now going to cause the two of you to fight. This is what Iblis promised Allah. لَأُغْوِيَنَّمْ فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّمْ مَجْمَعِينَ I'm going to beguile them. How? By causing divisions, fissions, where we argue which village we come from, which community we come from, which community is better. And then we get to the nth level that we have mosques today, new mosque, old mosque. And you find they die, just like in Romeo and Juliet, you had the Capulets and the Montagues. Until they died, it was haram to go to the other side. This is nothing short of jahiliya. When two mosques cannot iron the differences, this is nothing short of jahiliya. You know, let the world hear this. When I find two mosques that cannot bury their hatchet, and they have anger for each other, when both are lovers of Ahlul Bayt, then either both are wrong or one is definitely wrong. For it is impossible that prophets and imams ever had a dispute with each other. They were parallel lines. They never argued with each other. They never fought with each other. They were all towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have an obligation tonight. When we talk about Abbas alayhi salam tonight, the Qamar ibn Hashim, the Alamdar, the one who carried the flag, when his shujaat, when his strength comes forward, it doesn't come freely. It comes with unity. It comes with submission. It comes with vision. It comes with love and grace. And you take the entire world under your dominion. For then you find inclusivity is the religion of Islam. When Allah says, وَاَتَصِّمْ وَبِحَبْ لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا So the enemy is dividing us. When you and I hear talk and gossip about each other, when you and I hear talk about other religions, be very careful. When people say, oh, that Christian is a kafir, excuse me, what do you mean kafir? Maybe that Christian has better faith than you and I. What do you mean by, oh, he's a Christian? I said, so what? If you were born a Christian, what do you think you would be doing? Oh, he's a Hindu, he's, not, he's, he's kafir. I said, stop. Stop making such statements. This condemnation attitude is what's leading to all these wars today. You know, these pulpits are being used as poison, poison pills to be spilling out on societies. You find the right-wing evangelical groups are doing nothing but condemning everyone other than them. And then other groups are condemning. ISIS is condemning. The Jews are condemning. The Christians are condemning. But then all of this leads to people who now arm themselves, like what happened in Christchurch. Then the guy felt it was his right to go and kill. And he does it like it's a show. And he's got a body camera on him while he is killing people, worshipping God. Can you imagine how absurd this world has become today? You think these people, they were ordinary people, but they were misinformed on these pulpits. They read manifestos on how to eradicate different groups, manifestos, like the one who killed people in Sweden. You see, manifesto. Indiscriminate killing, a group of youth going for a camp and he just goes and shoots them indiscriminately only because they were supporting diversity in their country. Today you got Brexit. This only argument is we don't want foreigners. I say to them, stop putting your cause in the land of the foreigners. Maybe they won't come and invade you. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We don't want immigration. You say, where do you think these people are coming from? You're the ones dropping bombs on them, and they have no place to go, so they have to escape their countries, and then when they come to your country, you throw them in the sea. 
This level of injustice is why we commemorate Karbala. And you will see the spirit of Karbala is rising. You will see that the, form, the foremost people who are rising to bring justice and equity, not for the Shia, for the human race. When Allah says, we made you into various tribes and nations. Ya nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Mankind, we made you into nations and tribes. You see, so you, you know each other. It's beautiful. When I look around and I travel, I'm at the airport, I see black people, pitch black, and I see white, white, and in between, every color, every shape. And I say, where is this ugliness that people are claiming one right or the idea that one race is superior to another. Where? I see nothing but magnificent. That hue of varieties, dark to light, to brown, to yellow. Subhanallah, lita'arafu. We made you into this. Whoever told you to go and eradicate the system of God? Diversity is the religion of Allah. You find that monolithic societies, you find every group wants to create a monolithic society. Let's eradicate everyone who's not like us so that we can live in peace. Hitler tried, the Romans tried, the Persians tried. You can never, ever make a society monolithic. It's not by design. And don't play with the nature of God. Honor diversity and agree to disagree agreeably, otherwise Allah will punish us on judgment day. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I'm very passionate about this because when I read the news every single day and I'm seeing this tyranny taking place where good people are being branded as terrorists. And today you even allude to the idea that you like them. And these lectures are being heard and this being written down. Oh, look what he's saying. Hmm. So what should we do? Cut our tongues off? Hmm? Should we be silent when injustice is taking place? Allah on Judgment Day will ask us, I gave you this tongue. You did not say anything, you did not. But I'll tell us, more than complaining to the enemy's side, I complain to us, I complain to me. We have an established institutions to nurture our next generations. MashaAllah, here, Az Zahra College is doing something to raise children within the paradigm of Islam. Hmm? Little good work that's going to go a long way, inshallah. But we need to do a lot more. We're very, very shallow in the Western societies. Our next generations are being left. In Michigan, in 24 hours, three people overdosed and died. Died of, you know what? Sad, when you look at statistics, how is it our children? We've got our sisters who are addicted. Our sisters are now even addicted to even smoking. Sisters, with all due respect, brothers shouldn't even be touching it. Sisters, you're the mothers of our children. You're our future. This is where children come from. This is why you're so sacred in Islam. Your hijab is for that reason that you are the source of our next generations. Allah Mahili was asked, your generations are good. They said, our mothers are pure. They maintain sanctity and dignity. Hence, their children come out good, not exposed in public freely to be used for media and to be used for the economic system in the capitalistic, voracious society. We wonder, we shrug our shoulders. Why? Why does Allah enjoin upon us? You know, Ya Yun Nabi Kulli Azwajika wa Banatika wa Nisa il Mu'minina Yudnina Alayhinna min Jalabi Bihinna. Thalika Adna an Yu'rafna Fala Yudaina. Listen to the verse. O oh Messenger, tell Kulli Azwajika, your wives, wa Banatika, your daughters, wa Nisa il Mu'minin, and the believing women. Let them cover their body. Let them cover themselves. This is superior. So they are honored. You know, yu'rafna means not only recognize, but you're recognized with honor. Therefore, you will not be bothered. Today, societies want to take this away from us. You can wear dresses upside down, backwards, with nothing in it, cut it, burn it, do whatever. It's cool. You cover yourself, you're uncool. Something's wrong with you. This is odd. 
You would think that if the fashion industry wanted you to do as you want, then why are we being dissuaded for this? And why are there legislations preventing our women from dressing modestly and decently? Because they can't sell products without exposing women. If you ever see products being sold, usually men are good looking, by the way, but you know, we're, we're just not marketable. You have a product, you put a man next to it, nobody wants to buy it. Put a woman next to it, everybody wants to buy it. So with all due respect, but our women are not objects of selling. They are dignified. They are beautiful. They are the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the mothers of our children. When I remember Zainab alayhi salam, and I remember the women of Karbala, I said, wow, they have taught me what is the value of womanhood. That they can be intrepid. They can stand in front of tyrants and speak with valor and be unafraid. Like Fatima al-Zahra when she went to claim her right that was taken away from her, she was valorous, dignified, full of wisdom, and she spoke with equity. This is the womanhood we're talking at. Women who are leaders in our community, not second class citizens that the West is trying to present us as. We are first class citizens on both sides. And let us not allow this division, even between genders, where one says, well, my gender is better than the other. Shaitan is waiting. Good. Or you, you don't like the women? Good. Or the women says, men are really bad. You don't like men? Good. Shaitan comes and he causes what we call disunity in us. Whereas male and female are the wings of a bird, I always say. If you ever want to see a bird fly, it needs two wings. You can't take the right, left wing and put it on the right side, nor can you take the right wing and put it on the left side. The bird will not fly. And you cannot clip either side. You clip one side, the bird will go into a tailspin. Equal. And sometimes one wing flaps stronger than the other. Sometimes it's the man who has to go and fight. And sometimes it's the woman who has to stay home and take charge of the family. That differentiation is what gives freedom to the bird and gives it direction to fly as it is. It is wrong for us to be clipping wings of each other. This is not Islam. Islam is a religion of justice. It's the religion of equity. To that level that Imam Ali takes this man and says, you have taken my shield. He goes to court and when he enters the court, the Hakim Shar'i, the judge, addresses Imam Ali -Islam in an honorific way because he was the Khalifatullah. Imam looks at the judge and says, you have committed breach of justice by honoring me more than the defendant, for I am the plaintiff. And you have honored me already when the judgment hasn't come out. How can you do that? Look at that kind of justice. How many people do you and I know that when they can wield power and they can snap their fingers and kill somebody, but they are so just, that they tell the judge, don't give me any higher status than the defendant, for I have a case in court. How many travel the world, go to seven continents, and try to look for people like these, you will find maybe one in a billion. Very, very, very few. Those who have power, they are corrupt, and they love it, and they love to wield it, and they love to destroy the world. People who have power in, with God consciousness, a very few who know how to manage it carefully. The judge apologizes and then he asked Imam Ali who is your witness? He said, my son Hassan. He said, then produce your witness. Imam says, my son is not present. He is not here currently. Now, Imam knew this. But Imam is going through due process. And he knows he's going to lose. If the Imam really wanted to win, he could have cornered this Christian man. But he doesn't. He said, I don't have any more witnesses. What will you say, judge? Judge says, well, then in that case, you lose the case. The shield remains with the Christian man. SubhanAllah. Would you and I allow that? Hmm? You and I would say, this is, this is an insult. You're insulting me with my authority and my, you know, power. Do you ever see when we become leaders in our communities, how we walk in haughty ways, like we're big shots? Hmm? Allah says, Inna Allah la yuhibbu kulla muhtalin fakhoor. Waqsid fi mashik. Waqdud min sawti. God doesn't like an arrogant show off. To go, oh, I'm so powerful. I'm something. Even Imam Hussain alayhi salam, who was the ultimate power of his time, was humble, gentle, talking with wisdom. This is the Islam we're talking about. This is the Islam that you and I need to practice. And the Christian man walks outside. He says, God truly knows where to put his leaders. Think about this. 
And Imam looks at him, he says, what do you mean? He said, you know that this shield is yours, and I know it's yours. But my God, I've never seen a man who follows this kind of justice. That you have gone through due process, and you're willing to relinquish your right, because you've gone through justice. He says, not only am I giving the shield back to you, I want to bear witness, and I want to be a Muslim. And it is his shahadatain. Imam says, why do you want to do this? Are you coerced? Are you being pushed on this? He said, no. I am so touched by your justice that I know this is the religion of God. And you are his authority. And he did his shahadatain and he became a Muslim. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the power to rise and to be firm. But if we do not bring unity within ourselves and love for each other and stop backbiting, it's amazing. In Michigan where I come from, in other, other parts of the world, you find people do business. The minute somebody opens a business across the street, they want to challenge, or oh, this one's gonna open the business just to put this other one out of business. Like you couldn't find another spot. No. This guy drops one penny, I'm gonna drop two pennies. It led to such arguments in Michigan that one of them got angry and took a, an actual shotgun and went and killed the other brother. For the sake of a few pennies, he made orphans. This is exactly how shaitan wants it. For foolish little things, you and I will argue. For foolish little difference of opinion or cultures that we come from and we paint broad brushes against people. I give us an advice, never ever use a broad brush on negative issues. When you're gonna talk about a people, never use broad brushes. Use broad brushes as an analogy only for good things about people. All Arab, all American, all white, and they say something good about it. If you say something bad, you have committed breach of justice. Use a fine brush when you criticize. And do it only to be constructively critical. Do not put down a human being. I don't care if that person is your arch enemy. Do not put them down. Put down what they believe in, but do not put them down. Because when you put them down, you are blocking them from ever becoming believers. As I mentioned yesterday, it's amazing the responsibility you and I have. When Allah says, لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ You know why the majority of the world is not Muslim? Why? You think Allah doesn't want them to become followers? You know why? Because we who have been endowed to be the witnesses over the people are not doing our jobs. This is why the majority of the world is not Muslim. If you and I united and didn't allow the enemies to divide us and we remain firm in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, guaranteed you and I would be the most powerful army on earth for the promotion of good and the demotion of evil. Hands down. It's logical. But how many of us know the Quran? How many of us know Tawheed? And I put myself into this question, not only you. We all have an obligation. Every single day when I am in the university and I'm talking to students, they come with a sincere heart. Tell me, what is A? What is B? Why do you believe in this? And I look at them and say, wow, these are rudimentary questions for me. Maybe because I've done this. But look at how thirsty they are to know. You sit down and you start talking. They look at you. I haven't heard of this. You know, when I debated Dan Barker the first time, there was a woman from Columbia University who was present an older woman, and after the debate, she looked very confused, dazed. And my brother-in-law, Hajali Khalfan, goes and talks to her and says, you look a bit confused, is everything okay? She said, all my life as an atheist, I argued against Christianity and the God of the Christians. And I knew that the God of the Christians are wrong. There is no way God can have a son who dies on the cross for the sins of someone else. 
There is no way God dies. This doesn't make sense to me. Even Dan Barker, who I debated, said to a Christian, your God who dies and comes back alive, I can never believe in them. Impossible. But the God of the Muslims, maybe I can believe in it. This is an atheist saying this. That lady, she said, I have never heard of Tawheed this way. I never heard of the oneness of God this way. I never knew that this God is so merciful and he is so omnipotent and omniscient the way this has been described. The one who is not vindictive, the one who doesn't kill indiscriminately, the one who does not look down on a community over the other. I never knew this. So my brother-in-law asked her, then what is your thought? She says, I'm going to go home and rethink for I have been misinformed. And he put a smile on my face, knowing, subhanAllah, that if a debate can take place where an atheist was ardently, consistently thinking that they are right, and suddenly they hear the alternative idea, that they change their minds, you know how powerful that is? SubhanAllah. When an atheist comes to, him, to the Holy Prophet وسلم, and says, I don't believe in God. The Prophet didn't say, Kafir, Astaghfirullah, you're going to Jahannam. Some of us say, he's an atheist, la hawla wa la, get rid of him, haram, haram, he says, stop, he's a human being. Ibn Abi Awja was an atheist who used to debate Imam Jafar Sadiq all the time, and Imam never, never put him down. He used to constantly look at him and said, oh Ibn Abi Awja, what do you think of this? How about this? How about this wager? How? And Ibn Abi Awja was stunned by the wisdom of our sixth Imam, that he never condemned him, but always welcomed him. So when an atheist is asking the question, reason with them. But how often do we have the capacity to reason if we haven't taken into account our own reason? A father comes to me one day and says, can you please tell my son atheism is wrong? I said, what's wrong with him? He said, no, he's become an atheist. I said, okay. I said, why don't you tell him? He says, well, I don't know how. I said, no wonder your son is an atheist. So what do you mean? I said, you're claiming to be a believer in God, but you don't know how. So he's confused that my own father is not sure. And my own father cannot tell me what is Tawheed. So why should I believe in him? My scientist teacher, they seem more rational than logical. And all the what's on the web out there condemning Islam seems more rational. So I said to the father, can I give you an advice? You're not too old yet. Trust me, even if you're 2000 years old, you're not old. Go learn something now. Spend time. And maybe this is a calling from God through your son to you. Then wake up and on judgment day, Allah will ask you too. Did you truly believe in it? Or did you just propose it because your father proposed it? Now we're not saying you're wrong, but what is your clarity in this matter? So we need to spend some time. Yesterday a few brothers came to me and said, brother, which books should I read? Put a smile on my face. What do you like to read? He says, I like to read philosophy. I want to know about religion. I want to know about Islam. I said, MashaAllah. I pray for you. Here are the list of books you should read. Start. You feel important? Read it. It's, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Al-ilm wa ilman. There are two kinds of ilm. Hmm? Masmu wa matbu. You find masmu is the knowledge you hear and it goes out the other ear. You heard it, but you didn't understand it. Then there's matbu. Matbu is the one you absorb. The Holy Prophet said, the knowledge which doesn't help you is the one you hear. The knowledge which helps you is the one you absorb. Absorption means you're going to practice it. You're going to live it. You're going to walk on it. Just like yesterday I gave the example of the Arab dwellers. Qalatil Arabu Amanna. Lip service. No. Absorb it. Submit. Follow. Reflect. Meditate. People say Quran has got 6,000 plus verses, you know, 6,236 verses. Oh, it's lots of verses difficult. I said, take one. Take one. Ponder on it. Reflect on it. The verse that resonates with you about anything you like. If you like justice, there are verses of justice. If you like love, there are verses of love. If you like worship, if you love, what do you like? La ratbin wa la yabisin illa fi kitab. Everything is in the Quran. Which one? Take one, absorb it, learn it. So the messenger is asking this atheist, why are you an atheist? See, now there's an absorption. So the man says, well, I didn't see him create. So he doesn't exist. See people say, I didn't see God create. You see, can you see God? So the prophet with a smile asks him, since you didn't see God create, then who created? 
because you were nothing before. هل أتى على الإنسان حين من الدهر لم يكن شيء مذكورا؟ Has mankind not taken into account that there was a time they were not worthy of being mentioned? شيئاً مذكورا. You and I, before we were born, if we went to our parents and we said, you know, if people went to my parents and said, what do you think of Hassanain? They would look at me and say, who? Doesn't exist. Are you, are you feeling okay? There is no such a thing as Hassanain. It doesn't exist. I didn't exist then. It's absurd for my parents to be questioned. But once I'm born, it's a whole different world. Hmm? Allah says, look, you are not worthy of being mentioned. Here's my daughter, not worthy of being mentioned before she was born. This daughter of mine, when she was born, the first thing she was in my hand, I held her. The first thought that came in my hand when I held her was, Oh Allah, I had nothing to do with the shape and the beauty of this child. And she grabbed my finger and I said, How did you do this? Tightly. And the first thought that came in my mind was, How can anyone not believe in God? First thought, I swear. Second, you're a father. You're responsible. And for the rest of your life, everything you do, she will be affected by it. So watch out, for she is another chance for you. For if you ever complain to Allah that I wish I could go back and fix myself, Allah says, I just gave you a new one. Start again. Isn't it amazing? So the Prophet is now talking logically to this individual and asking if you didn't see Allah create, who did? He says, I don't know. He says, if you don't know, then how do you know that he didn't create? And the man was stunned. Look at the logic. Bil hikmah wal mawidatil hasana. Subhanallah. Believe me, you listen to all the lectures in the world, attend the finest universities in the world, you will not get this kind of conversations. I'm not claiming to be an erudite in education, but I have traveled, I've been in academia for years, and I read relatively nothing equals this conversation. Simple, sublime, to the point, succinct, and it strikes it home. So the man was stunned. The Prophet looked at him and said, you see, atheism is a blind leap of faith. That's what it is. Blind leap of faith. No meaning. But what you find is, they attack us. Oh, you people don't believe. You claim to believe in God. You haven't seen. That's blind. No. That's the blind. Because lack of evidence is never evidence for an argument. To say, I can't see God, therefore God doesn't exist, is the most absurd idea in logic and in law. So what you find is, the Prophet says to him, it is wiser for you to be an agnostic and to suspend your faith than to take a blind leap of faith to reject something. This is hikmah that we have among our leaders that the Imams were following so well that they became the role models for humanity and they changed the lives of people that when they heard one sentence of truth, they said, I was going to go in that direction, in the wrong direction, but you looked at me, you asked me a very valuable question which I did not ponder on before, I absorbed it and my life changed and here I am today a much better person. Thank you for that 30 seconds of good advice. You and I have that responsibility. So Allah says you are witnesses over the people. So many of us think that when we praise Ahl al-Bayt we're out there in the Colosseum you know, Haydar Labbaik, hmm? Ya Rasulullah, Allahu Akbar, nice. Where are you? Oh, I'm in the Colosseum, on the, you see, on the seats, looking at the prophets and the imams fighting the devils. No, wrong idea, wrong image. You and I are in the arena with the battle. And you and I are being monitored by the angels in Allah. And they are cheering us when you and I do something good. Allah mentioned in Surah Zumar that when you worship Allah and you do good, the angels pray for you. The Holy Prophet said, if you read Surah Al-Kahf, he says, a beam of light penetrates your heart to the Kaaba, to the Kaaba in the sky. And in it are angels who do nothing but zikr in your name. This is the Islam we're talking about. So I say to us all, please, 
We have an obligation. We've got to start somewhere to say, I am good in speech, or I am good in money, or I'm good in business, or I'm good in A or B or C, whatever. Let's go help societies. Let's go eradicate poverty. Let's donate for the needy. Let's take care of the orphans and the wayfarers. They gave for the love of Allah. But you not only give that, you give yourself. And if time comes and you become a person like Ibn Sakit, where you're ready for shahada and you realize this world has no meaning until you rise to the occasion by which you, you stand up and say, if my death becomes a means to the good for society, and it becomes a means by which I will promote justice and good for the sake of humanity. And today the forces that are making the enemies tremble, who have become shuhada, they have given their blood for the sake of justice and peace to put the, t the tyrants dead in their tracks our honor to them Allah says لا تقولوا لمن يقتلوا في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون do not say those who die in the way of Allah are dead nay they are alive but you can't see them now you and I may think how did they become shuhada you know when you assess the value of this world children mother family friends, scholars. When you examine, it's all transient. Al-malu wal-banoon, zinatul hayat al-dunya. I always wonder when I see these great sages who went to Karbala, who gave their souls, I always wonder, what was the strength that drove you there? Like, you know, Ibn Sikit, I'll give you a quick example. Ibn Sikit was a teacher of a Abbasid king, Mu'tasim. And you find that he had two sons. And he said to Ibn Sikit, you teach my sons. Remember, the Banu Umayyad came. What was their objective? Suppress love of Ahlul Bayt. There's only one objective they have. Love of Ali ibn Abi Talib to them is haram. He is one of their Khalifas, but they are so jealous of him. They can't stand it. As a result, they created a very hostile environment. Until today, if your name is Ali, Fatima, Zahra, Zainab, right? If your names are any of these, or Hassan, or Hussein, oh, you're dangerous. What happens, you find, is shaitan knows where the truth lies. And he has focused on it laser-like. Laser-like. You look at Middle Eastern politics. You look at a country like Saudi Arabia, that bombed the United States and brought two buildings down where thousands of people died and 15 out of the 19 pilots were from that country, they weren't even scratched. It's amazing. Afghanistan was punished, Iraq was punished. But this country that had a hand in it, nothing. Why? They're ours, they're like us. Journalists, there's a ban called Muslim ban in the United States. But these countries are not banned. So I, make, I wonder, are they Muslim? Because it's a Muslim ban, you see? And these are allowed to come in. So America is dictating who's a Muslim now. Amazing. Hmm? Subhanallah. So now you find, if you examine carefully, you will see the nations that rise for justice. And you find their energy comes from Ahlul Bayt. This is something profoundly obvious. And the enemies, when Lawrence of Arabia went to Hijaz and created this family, Ibn Saud, and put them there, and Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, there was one objective, silence the love of Ahl al-Bayt. Silence it. Do not allow it to rise. Honestly, you study it, you will see. When you love Ahl al-Bayt, they rise, they look at you.
Imam Ali alayhi salam, in the battle of Siffin, when they, Muawiyah put the pages of the, of the Quran forward, Imam says, Ana an nabay al -Azim. I am Amma Yata'alun. You ask about an nabay al -Azim, alladhi hum fihi mukhtalifun. You have a difference. I am that an nabay al -Azim. Not only is it the day of judgment, but I am also an nabay al -Azim. And you fear me because I am the standard bearer, as we say, Quran al natiq I'm the moving, walking Quran, and Shaitan knows that as long as this one walks, and this one becomes the gate to the city of knowledge, the one who represents and reflects the message of the Prophet, then Shaitan's machinery falls apart. So if you look at the geopolitics of the world today, you will see any time you love Ahlul Bayt, you will be questioned, who? But you know what the irony is? Subhanallah. In Washington, publicly I've heard it, they say the Shia who love Ahl al-Bayt are the most peaceful people in the Middle East. I've heard it in Washington among the congressmen who are stating that these people are not terrorists. They don't kill. They are peace-loving people because our Imam and our prophets have taught us to love humanity. We don't indiscriminately bomb ourselves. We don't go kill people. We don't attack them. Subhanallah. But the love of Ahlul Bayt. So Allah says, then stand firm. That if they want to silence you, and they want you not to rise to the occasion, then rise. I say to us all, when we learn, let's be the best. When we speak, let's be the finest. When we dress, let's be elegant. Hmm? When our mannerisms are brought forth, let's be impeccable in behavior. When the world asks us, who are you? How is it you have such clarity in your thought and that your adab is so impeccable smile and say i have been guided with the best of guidance you would be amazed how many people will fall in love with us in society we're very very blessed and when we go to karbala and we see imam hussein alayhi salam when he says hal min nasan in yansuruna we go to abbas alayhi salam tonight being the eighth night, we remember this, what they call Qamar ibn Hashim, the story of Abbas. You know, when we listen to him and we reflect on him, I want it to absorb us. Matbu' ilmul matbu'. Let it become part of our flesh. Abbas salam, should become so real to us that our strength should rise, that when an enemy threatens us, we just look at them and say, I have Abbas as my leader. I have Abbas who taught me how to service Imam Hussein. They say Abbas was about 11 years of age. And in the Battle of Siffin, he shows up armored and fighting. They say one of the horses of Imam Hassan was taken by the Banu Mayyad, and he chases it and brings the horse back. They say Muawiyah and his army noticed this young boy, but he was so armored, they thought it's Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because he was trained personally by his father, Imam Ali alayhi salam. We go back in history, we see when Fatima al Zahra salamullahi alayha passed away on the Musalla in grievance. She was madluma, she was abused, and she smiled. When the Prophet told her, soon after my departure, you will join me. She smiled. She first cried, knowing the Prophet is leaving. Then she smiled, knowing she will join the Prophet. And she was a late teenager. She holds the hand of her husband. She says, after my departure, find a woman. And find her to be the mother of children for you. For she will, my son Hussein will be needed in Karbala. For he will need help her. And Umm al-Banin Fatima alayhi salam, the mother of Abbas, bore four sons. Abbas, hmm? you find Abdullah, Jafar, and Uthman, four sons. All four of them became martyrs in Karbala, all four of them. The mother of Abbas was the, was the cousin of Shimr al Joshan, the same arch enemy of God, they were cousins. And they tried their best to remove Abbas from Imam Hussein's army. When Shimr comes with the letter from Ibn Ziyad, and Ibn Ziyad tells him, get the bay'ah of Hussein or kill him, 
Before he does that letter, he first comes to the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and calls out for Abbas. They say Abbas was standing there. As you know, by the way, the strongest person in an army is the flag bearer. Don't forget that. It's the one with the flag who is the emotion of the army. The longer the flag stands, the more energy we have that we're winning, we're winning. When the flag falls, that's when you start thinking, okay, we're losing. That's why the flag bearer was always the strongest. They had no fear. Ashiddawal hmm? al-Kuffar, flag bearer. Imam Ali alayhi salam in the battle of Jamal when Aisha was fighting him in Basra, he says to Muhammad bin Hanafiya, he says, Muhammad, take this flag and run towards the army forward. As you know, there was a camel that the wife of the Prophet was in. He said, run forward. Muhammad bin Hanafi says to his father, the sky is black with arrows. He hesitated. He said, I felt a breeze pass me. I want you to know Imam Ali al I want you to understand his shuja. Hikmah, but incredibly powerful. Unafraid. And he says, I felt a breeze. And the next thing, the staff was gone. The flag was gone. And I see my father in the front, standing there, putting his banner forward. Allah loves these people. This is a man who had no fear when he came to justice. Amr bin Abdul was taunting the Prophet's army in the first battle, in the battle of, of Khandaq. That's the first, but the second. He was taunting them. Hmm? And you find that the Prophet said, go. This Amr is the giant of Arabia, and he is the leader of the Kuffar, the ultimate polytheist. And he jumped over the moat with a horse, and he's now poking into the tent. Everybody's terrified. Everybody's terrified. You find that the Prophet is asking, who will go fight Amr? And nobody stood up. Imam Ali stood up and said, I. Prophet said, sit down. Give them a chance. All these companions of mine, Give them a chance. I tell you, la fata illa Ali, wa la sayfi illa zulfiqar. There is no victory like Ali. And there is no sword that fought like Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam stands up and the Prophet said, now watch. Watch the ultimate believer, mu'min, fight the ultimate kafir. Imam Ali alayhi salam looks at Amr and says, oh Amr, I give you three options. Hmm? Don't fight me, leave. Become a Muslim and submit or I kill you. Amr starts to laugh. Said, you uh, get threatening me with three options. Imam says, I repeat. This, Allah says, ashidda wal al-kuffar. Fearless. This is the power. I'm telling you, they have smart bombs today. They have laser guided missiles. They have got all kinds of satellites watching us. But this Iman of Amir al muminin is the ultimate Iman. Iman. Honestly, it penetrates and it destroys them. And Imam Ali alayhi salam looks at him and Amr strikes him. They say he struck him so hard, Imam blocks it, hits his forehead and cuts into Imam's forehead. But all you heard in that cloud of dust was Allahu Akbar. And the next thing, Amr is on the floor and he has no legs. Allahumma salli ala Shujaat, strength. It doesn't come for free. It takes practice. Imam Ali alayhi salam, my entire strategy of fighting, he would tell his companions, you stand here, you stand here, you stand here. Tighten your grit. Do not slouch. Your skin is sagging. Tighten it for the sword will cut it. He would touch. He would tap into their, into their armor and say, strengthen this link, the enemy will strike you. He was so strategic. He said, my strategy was taught to me by the Prophet. I would follow him like a she-camel up the mountains and he would train me on how to fight. It was the Holy Prophet وسلم, who taught Imam Ali salam how to fight. And he taught Abbas. But Imam Ali salam, when he kills Amr bin Abd, he does it with dignity that he doesn't even take his armor. You know Amr's armor had gems on it. It had emeralds and diamonds on it. 
Nobody goes to war with gems. But they were taunting the enemy that I am so indomitable, you can't touch me. Look, I have gems on my armor. Imam Ali salam, when he kills Amr, he leaves the armor, doesn't take it. He says, because I didn't kill him for anybody but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When his sister came to collect his body, she said, I am very depressed that my brother was killed, but I am so honored as to who is the person that killed him. For the finest warrior killed my brother. This is Imam Ali alayhi salam. Abbas alayhi salam was taught by his father. He was intrepid. He was a flag bearer. And he was up front. Even in Medina, when Walid bin Utba calls him, Imam says to Abbas Alaihissalam, stand outside. He was of a tall stature, he was extremely handsome. They called him Qamar Bani Hashim. He was the moon of Bani Hashim. He was with wisdom, with dignity. And they say even as a child, whenever Imam Hussein would feel thirsty, he would run to go bring water. You know, Imam would watch him. This younger brother of his was so obedient to Imam Hussein alayhi salam and Imam Hassan that he would run like a little child quickly to make sure that his brother was always in a state of approval. This is Abbas we're talking about who's in Karbala now. This name Abbas is so powerful. In America, I once met a young brother and I mentioned him many times in my lectures during these moments who was a Christian who was from the Christian faith, and he meets me at one of the centers, and we have a dialogue about Islam. He was already gravitating towards Islam. He needed some more clarity. We sat for about an hour. We stood there, we talked. I laughed. This was Ramadan. Ashura, I meet him. I hug him. I said, George, it's very nice to meet you. He said, I'm not George anymore. My name is Abbas. So I said to him, why Abbas? He said, I am that strength, the way Abbas was with Imam Hussein. This is a boy who was a Christian who became a Muslim. The next day, he's saying to me, my name is Abbas now. I love the strength and the valor of Islam, that I am upright and I stand with valor, the way my prophet and the Imam stood up for justice. Allah took him from this world at a young age. He has passed away, may Allah rest his soul, but he's in my heart. For well, this boy has chosen his destiny. Allah says, Inna Allah la ma biqawmin. We won't change your affairs until you change it first. I said, what an honor, O oh Abbas, that you took that step towards Allah and you died a believer in the best of ways. But the power of Abbas salam, continues to resonate even among non-Muslims who become believers who take his name. In Karbala, he stood. Historians say he managed the center flank of Imam's army. As you know, Imam broke the army into three parts. The middle part was his flank. Abbas fought and fought and killed many. Some people say he didn't fight. No, he fought. He was valiant. He was actually technically the last person before Imam Hussein to die. And Abbas comes back to Imam Hussein and he sees the children, Atash and Atash, were thirsty. Their tongues had become so dry. And they could not even swallow. You know, Imam Hussain alayhi salam used to take his little infant, Abdullah, and he would take his tongue and give it a little wetness for there was no water. Hatash, Ruqayya, the daughter of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, she was only four years of age. She pulls on to the robe of Abbas, says, al Atash, I'm thirsty. Abbas looks at her and says, I can't go and finish this. Let me try to at least sashit this thirst of my family before I leave. For Allah has given me strength. But alas, not to come back. Alas, he seeks permission from Imam Hussain alayhi He seeks permission and he says, give me the permission to go. As you know, Abbas, by the way, he had his sons there too. Two sons passed, became shaheed in Karbala. Abbas salam, had two sons in Karbala who became shuhada. He left one behind, Ubaidullah, with his mother, Ummul Banin. And when I go to Medina and I go to Jannatul Bakhi, the first place I do is I make a left turn and I look at her grave and I said, Ya Ummul Banin, you are the mother of all mothers, for you have given four beautiful sons with valor 
for the sake of justice. I take refuge with you. You are my role model mother, role model teacher. So Abbas alayhi salam is seeking permission. He said, let me go. You know, before this happened, by the way, Shimr comes with a letter and says, you are my cousin. I give you freedom. Leave before we kill Hussein. Abbas takes the letter, rips it, and steps on it and says, how dare you offer me this freedom when you're going to kill the grandson of the prophet, our living imam, you will kill him and you want me to have freedom? Never. We will never do this. Why did Shimmer do this? He wanted to weaken Imam Hussein's army by saying, if I can get Abbas to get out, then I will weaken Hussein ibn Ali. But Abbas was not like that. He was not for sale. Rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun wala bayun an dhikrillah. No. So Abbas alayhi salam gets on his horse with his sword and the water skin. He says, let me go and see if I can get some water. This is important to understand. That the Imam saw this is his last. He bid him goodbye. He said, Abbas, go if you can get it. They say when Abbas started to trot, they saw, he, they say, you know, he's, he was called a lion who lions feared. That was the title of Abbas. When he came on the battlefield, lions would fear him. He approached the water, the Euphrates, and all the armies moved away. They couldn't stand him. He comes freely. He descends from his horse, takes his mishk, and he puts it into the water. Now I want us to understand. If there is one message of sabr and iman, Abbas alayhi salam was also extremely thirsty. He was extremely thirsty. But can you imagine the sight of water? I remember in Ramadan one time I went to work out and I was so thirsty. Just touching that bottle was pleasure. The wetness of the bottle was pleasurable while I was fasting. And I thought of Imam Hussein. I, I remember just that water. I said, my God, I would love to touch this. How did my imam feel when he was on the battlefield? So Abbas says he's filling this cool water. He says the dogs can drink it. The animals can drink it. But we can't drink it. But he did not put one drop in his mouth. He takes it, covers it. He says, I will not drink it till my master drinks it first in his family. He puts it around his neck. Hmm? And he ascends his horse. Omar ibn Sa'ad sees this. He said, if these people get this water, they will fight us longer. Water must not reach Hussein ibn Ali. And Abbas as he's leaving, he's passing by a tree, one of the palm trees. They jump in front of him and cut one of his arms off. And the arm of Abbas falls. He swims, I mean, he turns, swings in the direction, and another soldier comes and cuts his other arm off. So Abbas's both arms have fallen. In that state of trotting, <laughs> that water bottle falls. Abbas is trying to hold it, trying to reach that goal. That little child is waiting for me to drink. But the enemy said, no. And one of the enemies of Yazid comes and hits Abbas with a mace on his head. And he strikes him very hard and Abbas falls for he is no, he's not able to defend himself. And as he's falling, he's calling his brother, Ya Akhi. But Imam Hussein from distance is watching, but he can't leave the tent. And Abbas falls and they take arrows and they shoot it right at the, that water skin and all the water spills out. And Abbas says, I cannot bring this water. And then he becomes shaheed. Assalamu alayka ya akhi. Ya abal fadlil Abbas. Oh Abbas, I said salam to you. Wa akhir al akhir minni salamu alayhi. There is nothing that Imam can do in Abbas until today. He's buried separately from there near the Euphrates as a symbol for his shujaat to have to fight for the sake of justice. Allah, 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 Allah,
وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم Let's recite together five times أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء when we care for those who are sick in our communities. Sayyid Hashim, as you know, needs our prayers. There are brothers and sisters in our communities who need our prayers. There are people outside of our communities who need prayers. If we pray for them, Allah says, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَشْكُرُونِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ Remember me, I will remember you. Let's pray sincerely with our hearts that Allah take this bala away from Yemen, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Kashmir, from Palestine. Take this bala away and give our community strength and justice, inshallah. Oh Allah, give us safety and wisdom and strength to rise for justice, for humanity. And give us strength to be learned and to be economically strong so that we can finance good structures and justice on earth. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Together. One more time. Let's recite dua for the return of Imam Sahib Zaman. Allah صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه وردك تواه وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على محمد وآل الطيبين الطاحرين صلى الله على محمد وآل محمد الفاتحة رائما خليل الله السلام عليك يا رثاء موسى كريم الله السلام عليك يا رثاء عيسى روح الله السلام عليك يا رثاء محمد
صلى على محمد وعلى محمد